Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Hey there, you are listening to Coast to Coast AM. Connie Willis here with you. I've got a couple friends here tonight. Tom Powell, welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. Thanks, Connie. Great to be here. What's going on with you? Well, you know, after a while, you you, you kind of get tired of of being the salesman for some of these topics. And, <laughs> and I, I think you just put your material out there. And then you just have to uh, see what sticks to the wall. But um, I, I don't know that being the the uh, go-to guy, the media personality, is always advancing <laughs> the topic. So I, I just kind of let other people do it. I, I got enough material out there, and um, you you know, I I, I just uh, would rather. Uh, do my own research then um Agreed. yeah you know as i said try to convince the world of ideas that are uh, <laughs> that just wear you down you know <laughs> i do like i said we have the same perspective on so many things now i'm a broadcaster so this is work this is what feeds me and i absolutely love what i do and i love that it's in this subject matter but i agree with you i'm not here to convince anybody prove to anybody uh, you know when people say well if you saw this why didn't you pull the camera out and get it well that's not what you're thinking when you're there and when you if you do think that by the time you look down even a second you're, you're going to miss what you could have at least enjoyed and had for your own self and and one of the things you got to stop and enjoy of course is family and and toward yes. that end i i think one of the first things that i got to do is is just a shout out to my aunt elise ty who uh lives in new albany indiana she just turned 94 and she wow. is an absolute die hard coast to coast listener i mean she never misses the show at 94 and I love it. She loves your work and uh, I, I just want to uh, uh, sort of like recognize her because I, I think for every person like this that I know of there there's, there's probably a thousand others but um, you know there's this one beautiful person in New Albany, Indiana, Elise Ty, who who just is a huge fan of what you're you're you guys are doing. Elise, thank you so much for being a fan of ours and listening to us. Thank you so much. I hope you are there with us right now. I'm I'm sure she's with she might even be a coast insider and listening to it tomorrow. But anyway, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And we love Tom. We absolutely love Tom Powell. Mm -hmm. And I love Elise. <laughs> oh, She's my great. godmother. It's kind of a Catholic thing, you know. <laughs> yep. 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 That's great. Well, that is, that's so nice. Well, it, there you go. If, if anything at all tonight, you got that. And, and that's an amazing thing. I agree with you. Family is very important. There's other things you've got to do in life, but man, when you get into this world and you get your research going, a lot of times what you experience um, you know, you sometimes you just got to hold it close to yourself because you still have to process it, and it still doesn't mean that it makes any sense. Maybe it might make sense in the future, but if you start putting theories to things, you got to be careful about that too. But it, it, it does. It changes your life in a way because, yeah. um, you know, the, the, these powers do push back. And uh, and so when you're sort of like uh, whacking the uh, hornet's nest with a stick, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't realize that what you're doing when you're being a researcher of this stuff. But what you find eventually is that when you study these topics, um, all of a sudden you realize that they're studying you, too. 
<laughs> yeah, they're having fun with you. Some of them, they're just having a good time with you <laughs> and messing with you. Well, now, do you remember William Dranganis, who has passed? But sure. Yes, I do. I do. Lived in Virginia, and um, he's a guy who was uh, sort of involved with the alphabet soup crowd, you know, CIA, NSA, yeah. blah, 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 FBI. Uh, but, but he was a super nice guy and very forthcoming and uh and and a very big researcher of it all who who's no longer with us but but he did a lot of uh, great work and was uh, one of my sort of early go-to guys as far as some of the weirder stuff that I was coming across and and in he sort of helped validate a lot of the directions that I uh was choosing at the time. This was back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Amazing man. Absolutely. You're right. Yeah, he was. Uh, it was interesting the way he described it to me at one point. He said, Connie, you know, when the CIA and the NSA and you said alphabet, when they need something, they would come to me. So he was the guy that knew the technology so far in advance so, and and if they said they needed something, he would he knew the technology enough to make whatever it was that they needed to make, being yes, able to draw did. from that and, technology. <laughs> and I, I did a uh, event in Ohio, Mark DeWorth thing in Salt Fork, and um, he was there and he brought some of his alphabet soup friends, and uh, <laughs> I made a bunch of jokes about. CIA and everything, and how that really, as 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 uh, paranormal researchers, that we're basically spies. We're 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 trying to learn about uh, beings that don't want to be necessarily outed, and uh, and and at the end of the show, they uh, through him just said we really enjoyed what you did, <laughs> and they they actually gave me some. CIA uh, tchotchkes, you know, <laughs> and, you know things like that, and uh, it, I, I was really touched that they were were sort of uh, willing to acknowledge that. Yeah, we're, we're, we we listen to what you guys say. Uh, we're we're not going to necessarily uh, come out of the shadows, but um, uh, we we study uh, all sources, and and you guys are. Uh, uh, doing reasonable uh, contributions to the knowledge. And he saw a couple while he was out with uh, his FBI guys uh, looking yep. for gold with metal detectors, right? So so he loved the Bigfoot world. He loved it. Now, the reason I brought that up pertaining to you is because at one point he had spoken to me about underground, and he was talking about the wood knocking, and he said something about where underground – the trees and any wood knocking, um, because of the root system, it could really travel far underground. So I thought about you and thought about him saying that. And also, I th did you even have some story where you had some knocking happening and then you and you drove, it, this might even been Bill's <laughs> story, but then you drove many miles away and then you heard that same kind of knocking when you got home. Was that you or no. maybe that was Bill? No, no, no. I, it might have been Bill too, but I definitely had one of these things. And, and again, as researchers, you, you sort of trade notes and you do find that other people have incredibly similar experiences. Mm -hmm. But mine was that I was uh, – working up near Mount Rainier at a active site where the family had repeat Bigfoot encounters. And I will say that this was late 90s, early 2000. I, I confess I wasn't overly sophisticated <laughs> at the time. And and at the time, we, we heard these tree knocks in the woods, and so we just assumed that these Sasquatch were – going around with sticks knocking on trees and and so we thought that that might be some form of communication that was worthy of exploitation and and so darn if i didn't sit there all night long with a louisville slugger all right <laughs> and, go big blue and knocking on trees <laughs> and 
Nothing happened. Absolutely nothing. And I always did the same cadence. Knock, knock, knock. Three things. That was that was my little code. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I just really thought it was going to produce something, uh, but it did not. And, and I did this for at least six hours. Well, it finally, close to dawn, I, I decided enough was enough. I had obligations, had to get home. I lived 100 miles away. And so before dawn, I drove the 100 miles, barely made it home, uh, you know, without just passing out from exhaustion. And the moment I got to my own property, I, I got out of the car, slammed the door, the sun just barely rising in the eastern horizon. It wasn't even over the horizon yet, just a glimmer of light and knock, knock, knock. Here I, I, I get the first response of the evening at my own house. <laughs> so, you know, here I am too exhausted to even venture back to the rear of my own property. That's how much <laughs> of a zombie I was at that point in the in the evening or morning, but obviously they were, uh, you know, toying with me. They, they were showing a sense of humor and acknowledgement that, you, you know, we knew what you were doing all night long, but, but how did that phenomenon travel with me for 100 miles? I, I was working up at Mount Rainier. I was down in Clackamas County um, I, I still scratch my head over the implications of what that uh, is, is saying, and, and then that is that they can travel with you somehow. <laughs> <laughs> they were they were in the back seat. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And and I have talked to people who who say, oh no, no, they they traveled home with you. And I'm like, well, th this defies conventional explanation. <laughs> With a, this is where the word paranormal starts to come into uh, right. the, the vocabulary because um, there is no easy way to explain how the phenomenon can travel with you for 100 miles and then, um, you know, uh, acknowledge you. Uh, right there in your own property, uh, it, it it's hilarious. <laughs> it is. It is. I, you know, I try to tell people too. I'm like, they're not us. You can't think like they're like us. They don't think like us. They're not us. You know, it's it's. Well, you, you also realize that we're dealing with a degree of sophistication. Yes. That oh, is, absolutely. Is really important to acknowledge. The, yes. the biggest mistake I think we can make is to assume a, a, a unsophistication, a, a, and then all of a sudden you come to realize that they're running circles around everything that we do. So I, I tell people nowadays that perhaps the most important thing that one could do if you really want to move forward with this whole you know, area of study is is do not employ tricks or traps, but mm -hmm. rather ask permission. However you do that is up to you. And and I do believe that employing sensitives and and people with um, communicative powers. So, Tom, let me. I want to bring up a few things to you that I've told you before, and it's going to lead into something for you. But I want to just bring these up again because they're just, they were just absolutely amazing, and it it goes into what we were talking about. So, the very first time that I ever went bigfooting, I like I grew up with a haunted in a haunted house with a ghost all my life, then went into the world of UFOs, went in from there, alien, from there, alien abductions, uh, from there, remote viewing. I mean, everything leads to another, to another, to another, to another. And at right one point I was pulling in, right? And one point I was pulling in documentaries because, you know, my trade, my world, my career, money making is, is not in the paranormal, is broadcasting a television, radio, film, things like that. And I was working with a uh, guy that was working with documentaries on the internet and he had, uh, so I was bringing in documentaries for him. And at one point I was sent a Bigfoot amateur documentary. And from there, 
uh, they had invited me to go to Alabama where they, there was all this activity happening. And, and I had never thought about Bigfoot ever, ever, just never thought about it, just never had gone there. And I just thought, oh, okay, whatever. That's fine. That's cool. That sounds good. And when I got there, they had vetted me for hours. Pat Ranch was a uh, Mark Green, Willie, Keith Tyler, just these these people are absolutely amazing. Been in this area for a long time. They said they believe there are two tribes of them, one a little nicer than the other. Anyway, I go after being vetted, truly vetted, and that's a smart thing to do. Keep your, your spot quiet and vet the people that go if you want activity. And um, the very first time I put my foot down in on out of the vehicle to clear you know we we're finding a clearing of where we were going to stay but the second i had opened the door from the truck that i was in uh passenger seat and got out there was what i heard was we are highly advanced and we're everywhere and i knew that i knew it and i knew that i heard it and i repeated it and it has been true ever since i absolutely believe that to be absolutely true they're highly advanced and they're everywhere and i absolutely believe they gave that to me and it was but, but when you when you get that when you first step out of the car i i should think that you would also find yourself wondering whether you weren't in some way being had this is just too good to be true <laughs> you know that 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 how did they know that I'm coming? It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy uh, realization uh, that does not sink in right away. I, I'm sure that, that it took you a few days to figure out what just happened, but, but they were waiting for you. And, you know, what does that say? That, that these things are, are just absolutely, um, whatever is behind the phenomenon, it represents a sophistication that um, leaves us in awe. And and you're right about that, but I didn't go there with that. I just took it in and out because because I knew that I heard it. I knew I knew, and I think from all my other uh, research along the way, and it wasn't even really research along the way. These things like usually come to you, right? It's like you don't even have to chase after stuff; it comes to you. I don't I don't know why that is, but uh, well, but that, then later, that's actually, the the best approach, although it it yes. It, uh, it's it's the hardest thing yes. to do, you know, because uh, it it's it's almost arrogant to say, "Here I am, now come to me." Uh, you know, you 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 sort of expect that that it's going to take more work to 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 bring the situation to the fore, uh, and then all of a sudden it it's it's inviting your uh, participation. Uh, that's not what people expect and and so it floors them and um i i I think it uh in many cases says they they start to go all right somebody's jerking my chain here this this, it it can't be like this uh and it it is not always you know but but i uh, the one thing i like to tell people is is uh if you study them for a while i mean months and years then then they start to know who you are and and they uh, study you yeah yeah i i i didn't i didn't have that thought of uh who's jerking me around there's been other times i've had that where i've been around people i didn't trust or that they would do tricks and pranks and things like that 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 i now i have to i have to weed out people you know, along the way, it's like, okay, I can't, because uh, oh, I no, want you, the real you, deal. You definitely, and, yeah. it, and it forces the a real skepticism, deal. which yeah. is unfortunate because in, in many cases, um, interesting things, valid things happen, but um, they're too easy to dismiss, it, yes. especially if you're trying to wear your scientist hat. <laughs> Throw that out the door. Put Hang that on the hat rack on your way in (laughs) well later later on um that night one of them had come up and they were shaking you know i'm just going to make a long story short but they were shaking the camper on all sides and and it seemed like whatever i said in my head like i i remember saying oh wow that was another shake oh maybe let's see if there's another one and there's another one and then it would i would go well i wonder if i'll feel one uh, on the other side 
uh, from the camper. And, and then it came from the other side of the camper and I didn't hear anything walk over. I didn't hear any brush or leaves or twigs break or anything like that. And, and it had said, if you unzip the zipper right here, basically it had said, uh, then, then you'll see us. And I was like, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And, and he said, well, you know, this is what it said back to me was, well, isn't that what you came for? And we had this little conversation back and forth, but it was so natural. I didn't think anything of it, told it the next day. Later on, when we're out there looking some more, and I'm totally exhausted through the weekend. This was in Alabama going, holy cow, all this stuff that's happening. This is absolutely amazing. But I I remember sitting in the car at one point, other people were out, and I was debating, do I keep the car on? Is that going to attract them? I don't want any more attraction. I'm worn out. This is killing me. I'm by myself, too. Or do I turn it off, and then it comes up to me, and I see it in the the window. I'm not ready for it. And so I had said to myself, I wonder why they hide. And a voice comes back and says, because our face frightens you, and that makes us sad, relating mm-hmm. to exactly what I had said before, but then showing me emotion. I It was amazing. It was amazing. But so all of this is happening by way of what is sometimes called mind, mind speak. speak. In other words, mind you were yeah. hearing yeah. what amounts to English in your yeah. head, yeah. and um, yet you, you cannot identify the source of this communication and and uh so this is a, a phenomenon that is is uh you know i i think you have to be doing it a few years before you even often consider that such things as this can happen so for you to have it happen to you um very early in your investigative career uh, kind of suggests that that they knew that you were a person who was going to evolve, and so they invested some effort. Uh, it, it it it's crazy, but the idea is that that they it it's 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 independent of language, but there is communication from mind to mind, and and it's really awesome to uh, not only realize that it's happening but to 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 be to have it happen to you and uh, it's it it, I, it it's unbelievable it boggles, it boggles the mind absolutely <laughs> and and it was so natural the thing is it was so natural that that it it wasn't scary or creepy it was later on that you it, you kind of it all hits you and you're going oh my gosh i had a conversation mm-hmm. i think it, a lot it can't of mine be that easy can it <laughs> well, you know, it, it, I know that's what I thought. I thought there's no way this can't happen. No way. But but well, just, I think a lot of it. Just, you put uh, yourself well, out there and, and yeah, you try absolutely. to be in the right spots, of, uh, you know, unbiased and yeah, uh, open yeah. and uh, and and then it, it does find you with a little more regularity. Now, here's the thing. You have to be careful of what you wish for, because once. <laughs> You, you open those lines of communication, they um, they can come find you at the damnedest of times, and you sometimes go, oh, my God, what have I done? They they know my um, mental address. email, shall we say. <laughs> I, I'm just going to send them your address. Well, I think a lot of it had to do with uh, studying the uh, alien and alien abduction and, and how deep I went with that. With, uh, yep. Uh, with uh, Jacobs and um, um, Bud Hopkins and getting deep into those conversations and, and into the world big time. And before that, uh, being in uh, a haunted house all my life where something was in it and as a little kid scared, you know, you develop great skills into knowing where the thing is only because you want to run from it. That's how I was. So I developed good mm-hmm. skills of where it was so I could be away and, from it. And then there's all these guys, you know, in Walker Ranch, and, and <laughs> who's the guy, Travis from Alabama, who, Travis who it puts Walton. himself out there, uh, and and uh, and like. they would, they all have the same kind of experiences that yeah. they can't even articulate on their TV shows of this communication that happens in the background, and, and that they they really come to realize that, that once they put themselves out there as a person who's... Uh, 
you know, following this, then then the phenomenon does in some form find you. It's flattering, but it's disconcerting at the same time. Flattering because, you know, they acknowledge your presence. Disconcerting because you can't always turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> that that can be very true. I, I like it, though, for me because I want to get to know them more and and, and have a relationship with them. I, I don't need to talk to the, uh, you know, I don't need to deal with some of the other past things that, that I've researched and stuff. Uh, these, these, the Sasquatch are, they're the way to go. They're the, they're the answers. I think, I think that's well, where we can get one a lot of the answers. things you said before was that like, what happened to you, Tom, you fell off the map. Yes. The where'd you go, and dude? To that question <laughs> is, is because I, I really felt like, you know, I was stuck to a phenomenon that, uh, you know, maybe I, I, I was in a little bit over my head. And um, why would so you say that? Why I, I would think you sometimes say sometimes you just have to leave it behind and go, I know you guys are out there and yeah. um, I respect uh, your power. But um, I, I just want to be a happy idiot struggling for the legal tender, as Jackson Brown would say. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I can say it in another way. Tell me if this is right, because I, I've been there. I think where you're talking about where it's like, oh my gosh, I just, I just want to live like a human. I want the human experience again. Cause once I, you, you know, cross you, that I, line, you forget the scab that is all of a sudden like a little bit, oh my God, what have I done here? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> totally get it. Totally get it. Now, when I was around you, you had your last day. As a school teacher, that was like your love. That was your thing. And then yeah. that's when you, you were gone. So how, how did that go for you? How, how long did that take for you to really well, kind of it, 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 was, it was a really interesting um, transition between Sasquatch as a forbidden subject to one that is absolutely enters the popular culture. In other words, in, in the early days of my um, – education career, uh, I, I would show a Leonard Nimoy in search of episode that the school district had on a 16 millimeter movie film. And I would use it to keep the kids engaged on the last day before Christmas vacation. But <laughs> even then the principal would say, I, I'm not completely comfortable with you using, you know, showing this stuff oh. uh, as part of a science thing. And I'm like, well, it's a it's a school district approved movie. What the hell? And then what what am I supposed to do with kids on the last day? Well, <laughs> by the, a few short years later, I, I had the parents coming in and saying, no, I, I want to see the movie. I, I want to know it. about this too. I, in fact, I ran into a really interesting abductee case by the parents of one of the brightest family of students I've ever seen and and turned out there was a book about her case and uh, Walter Webb was the author and uh, it was about a abductee case in um, in Vermont and this was a mom right there in my neighborhood and she opened up about her whole story and and I couldn't believe what I was listening to but she really didn't want me to use her name, but I did make a chapter about her abductee case. And it was actually a, a book which um, ended up being uh, one of the most respected uh, pieces of research about the abductee phenomenon because he was able to find both people who were abducted and uh, so on and so forth. It's an incredibly long story. <laughs> But it all came to me because I uh, uh, picked the scab, so to speak. In other words, I, I would present this stuff to the kids for one day. Uh, and and then the, very typically parents and, and, and uncles and aunts would come to me and say, hey, let me tell you about my story. Yes. And, and I collected an amazing amount of information um, mm. from my immediate neighborhood that I was in as a school teacher, as a you know, science teacher. Oh, imagine being on 
uh, one of the hosts on Coast to Coast and all the stories that come to you. It's excellent. You know, you get, you got plenty of content out there because they're doing the, the same kind of thing. And, and, and you get to hear stories that, you know, they're like, hey, you can't tell anybody else. And, of course, I'm going to keep that word because I want to hear the story. And and, and uh, there's just amazing, amazing encounters well, by people. Historically, in the, in the 90s, when I, I was first sort of – really getting serious about my research um what i found when i was working for the you know bfro bigfoot field research organization is that when you um had a spot on coast to coast um a huge flood of of new information would uh Mm. hit your website as a consequence of that publicity and and so what we came to realize is that um, there is this very large pent up uh, source of material, which um, you know especially is held by rural folk. And um, all, all of a sudden, if you stick your head up, so to speak, and uh, and 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 say I'm I recognize the validity of these experiences then a flood of information would come your way, and, and by uh, the Monday after, you had more um, sighting reports to investigate than you had time to undertake. And then you can write some more books from that and more and more. Tom Powell is also an author. You can check out his books on Amazon. You were talking about, in your book, The Serpent Mound and Crop Circles right, as being is, evidence. Um, in in, in um, southwest Ohio, uh, in the vicinity of Dayton, Ohio, which strangely enough is where I was born. <laughs> so you, you find yourself wondering, <laughs> did, did, did I have some early connection to this material? The Serpent Mound is is remarkable because it is the um, best example of one of these uh, effigy mounds that is absolutely, to this day, scientifically unexplained. How did they do that? How did they construct it? Why did they construct it? What was the purpose? And so on and so forth. But but the funny thing is that it, it, it came to me that these mounds, as they exist in a whole bunch of places throughout North America, that that maybe there's something mystical to the mounds of Earth, but it may also be an indication that there's all this this excavation going on subterranean and they got to get rid of the dirt and and oh they, love it um, can, <laughs> love it in such a way as to confuse us as to its origin <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of people say, stay away, don't dig it up. That's that's bad. That's bad. Well, why? Well, you know, I mean. It's holy, it's sacred. It's, yeah. yeah, dig it up and find out. <laughs> but, but we'll let Ron Moorhead do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, in my research, it seems that, that, that most of the mounds are dated to a period of around 100,000 to 75,000 years ago. Uh, prior to the uh, end of the Ice Age. But it it, it seems to indicate that around 100,000 years ago, um, there was a a very serious, uh, you know, reconfiguring of of the terrestrial arrangement. And, And probably this is when the pyramids, and other things uh, like it were also built. And, and the pyramids is, is one of the chapters that I treat in this recent book because they, too, defy simple uh, explanation. But the, the pyramids were not the tombs that we were all taught in, in school. They're a power plant. Uh, they generate power that was wirelessly transmitted in an oh-so-Tesla kind of way uh, but by a, a, a set of beings that um, aren't, aren't using them anymore, but, but they certainly built them uh, for some kind of power generation purposes. The, the pyramids are power plants. Can they still be configured to do that? No, they're, they're, they're kind of shattered 
Um, and, and either they had a meltdown, as it were. Uh, it, it, they're not radioactive, but um, they, they no longer function as they were intended. But it, it, I, I think it appears that they were dismantled on purpose, that, that for whatever reason, the, the, the beings that created them decided to um, – abandon the um, purpose and, and just get, leave the planet to the happy idiots, which, of course, are us. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're just waiting for us to, you know, kind of like figure it all out. They're really patient and um, they, they never left. But but the other installation that they quite certainly inhabit is the moon. Mm. The moon is, is, is this crazy object. It's too big. It's too close. It's too um, uniform in size. It, 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 how, how can an object be uh, exactly one four hundredth of the distance to the sun and one four hundredth of the size of the sun at that distance so that we get perfect lunar eclipses? Uh, no other planet that we know of has such a thing. And um, when, once you start examining the peculiarities, you, you, you really have to scratch your head and, and go, wait a minute, this is not an accident. <laughs> and doesn't, now you tell me, I don't remember all this stuff. It was a long time ago. You as a teacher, though, you know, you keep this on your mind. You're constantly teaching or you work, you're you're still teaching. Um the the so most planets most everything is moving all the time right spinning but the moon is like a fix to us so right. it's always it, looking at the it, same it, spot right in a locked orbit so that we only see one side and uh, that is that uh, unusual I mean, that's crazy that should not okay, thank happen you. okay um, the, the peculiarities of the moon are just endless and and so. Um, you know, not to bore people with, with too many, you know, peculiar details, but um, never. There, there's a reason that we only see one side, but what's going on on that back side, and why is that? And um, once, once you start to investigate those, and, and there are many books that people have written over the years about these things, and it, it really does suggest that um, the moon is probably an artificial satellite that was installed in orbit because um, there, there is no known um, astrophysical means by which such a large planet could be captured or formed, um, you know, in, in such close proximity to a, a, a it, it's almost like we're two planets orbiting each other. Um, it, it, it's crazy large and crazy strange. <laughs> well, what about with the other planets that have like eight moons and nine moons or however many moons that they have? Tiny. Are they the same way? No, the, not at all. They're I mean, not a fixed? Our moon is, is, a, is a, what, a, a sixth of the size of our own planet. And yet there's also very clear indications, uh, and, and NASA did many experiments with crashing things into the moon, and, and they determined that the, the damn thing is hollow, or Ding. there are very large empty areas. As NASA explores other planets like Mars, one of the first things that they come to realize is that the best way to keep astronauts alive in such a hostile environment is to install them subterranean. And so they're looking at ways to find these underground cavities and, and, and have those be the home of the astronauts. So then you start to ever go, oh, my God, you know, could the same thing be true with the Earth? And the answer is a definite yes. Now, we all know that the center of the Earth is molten, but you can excavate a, a mountain and reside there and be no closer to the molten center of the Earth than we are sitting here on the surface. 
So, and so uh, when, you know, we talk about this subterranean realm, it, it, it doesn't mean that the earth is hollow. It just means that there are sizable voids that are, um, you know, able to be inhabited. How, you said that the center of the earth is molten. We we really still, that's just a theory, because there's absolutely no way we've been able to go down there to prove it. Sure. Um, but but it does seem that some sort of heat source is moving this plate tectonic engine that is causing the continents to move around. So I, I think it's, it's totally reasonable to assume that... Um, you know, uh, uh, radioactive uh, energy is being um, exuded by the planet, which is driving the uh, plate tectonics and so on and so forth. But there is still plenty of, uh, of uh, places that can be excavated. And in fact, you know, the United States, ever since the Cold War began, has... Um, a whole bunch of, of underground um, military installations. They're called yeah. dumbs, deep underground military bases, um, and it's a it's a kind of a funny acronym, but <laughs> it, it, is. it is very much of a thing. And they they're in an arc completely around Washington D.C. These dumbs, and they, and they were there as, as Cold War, like I say, installations. But I I, I think it it goes much beyond that. Interestingly enough, um, I've heard many reports along the way from people that have been around quarries, and around these quarries, they've seen a lot of Bigfoot sightings. And yeah. to me, you know, there they are. They're going deeper and deeper. And, and, and when I've heard the stories, the, more interestingly, or interestingly enough, you know, a lot of stories you hear, encounters you hear, witnesses talking about one but around the quarries, usually it's two to three to four to five or even six. To me, it kind of seems like, well, did they break into their home or a chamber or something? Did they go too deep and they go up against something that's down below? Yeah. And I guess the big question is, do they need a, a cavity to access this underground realm or mm. can they move through solid material? And I, I think my research suggests that the answer is yes. <laughs> In other words, they can do both. There, there are underground there, – there are, there are access points. Water is a big one. You know, there's the USOs, un, yeah. underground – you know, un, excuse me, unidentified submersible objects. And that is a phenomenon that exists worldwide. The Russians have been much more so forthcoming about their experiences with USOs. But it does appear that a great deal of these, this, this ET crafts, these UFOs, are um, coming out of the water. So there is one vector by which you could access an underground realm that we absolutely cannot follow. But I, I don't think it's necessarily limited to that. Uh, my information uh, based on Native American sources is that even though that there are caves and things that they can use, that they can move through solid ground. They're, they're that sophisticated. And of course, I'm from Kentucky and Mammoth Cave. Woo! The largest Lord. cave complex in the United States. And yeah. there's enormous areas that are um, undiscovered. It, it's often said that for every one cave that we know of, there's 10 that we don't. And, and the uh, most common you know, question that the people in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky get that they are amused by is could you show us the un undiscovered areas <laughs> right right all right tom so before we grab a couple phone calls and the fact that it's the last segment and it flies when you're on here you know you, you think of the time you, you might go oh man the time is late but now it flies by uh for sure but i want to make sure you get to say things that you want to make sure you do say before you get off the air and go, oh, I could have had a V8 kind of thing. 
Well, one one thing is that I stayed with Joe and Tammy Hauser up there at the Montana yeah. Vortex when we did this Montana Con thing, and and they did an incredible job of organizing. I would never organize one of these events; it would be so <laughs> stressful. But um, I tell you, that Montana Vortex is legit. Uh, it's kind of like the Bermuda Triangle. I mean, every, it's easy to make jokes about, and it, it, you, you think there's, it's got to be a sideshow. It's right there outside of Glacier Park. It is not. It is legit. And we stayed there, my wife and I, and, and it was very impressive. But there are other places, and, and that area in Ohio uh, is Suzanne Ferencheck and her husband, Bernie, are really uh, studying these areas in Ohio where, where just crazy stuff goes on. Uh, I mean, there's more than one Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> yeah, I uh, exactly. Like a lot of people as well hear about Skinwalker and Bradshaw, and it's like, you know what? Mm-hmm. These places are everywhere. You just happen to recognize that name. It's been said more or something like that, but uh, they're yeah. everywhere, and there's ones we have no clue about. Well, but they they do are these vortexes. They are these energy spots, and um, they they do appear to be places where um, one can um, jump realms. And uh, so, whether you're going maybe to the subterranean realm or or e- even to another place uh, on the other on another part of the galaxy, uh, it, it they quite plainly do exist. And and this study of ley lines and energy uh, spots uh, as they exist planet-wide is, is, uh, is gaining much validity as time goes on. What do you think of the magnetic field? Do you think that's important to all this? Well, absolutely, but it, it varies greatly. And one of the things that seems to be a, a, a vector is intense storms. And um, it was first, uh, you know, sort of observed by these people who flew through uh, places in um, around Bermuda, you know, not necessarily within this made up triangle that was kind of devised by Charles Berlitz for a book. But, you know, when strong storms develop, it it does seem that um, that is a uh, cover, perhaps for things to come and go from our realm uh, and and sort of uh, uh, not be detected because of this tremendous energy that that is being, um, you know, sort of contained uh, within this storm. So there's, there, there is something about these really strong storms that uh, makes it really easy for things to enter our realm um, without being, you know, detected by the military and all that. So I started uh, because I grew up in a house that had something in it, and then it led to something else, to something else, to something else, to something else, to the Bigfoot, to the Dogman, to the other little entities that are mm-hmm. just absolutely crazy out there. Well, you, you were in Kentucky, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Native Americans wouldn't even go into Kentucky. They said that, that <laughs> is the, the realm that, you know, Kentucky and West Virginia, that, that was like, no, no, no. And another tribe owns that. We don't even go there. So, <laughs> so darn right you were running into that stuff. It, it was all happening. But I went in that direction to like the Bigfoot. You went from like the Bigfoot to then going into a wider interest of paranormal in general, correct? How did that happen? I did. I did. Well, because largely because of Native American sources sort of steered me in that direction. You know, they pat me on the head. Oh, you you white people, that's so great that you're finally getting interested in our stuff. Um, But um, they did say that, um, well, my question to them was, the Sasquatch have to be going somewhere. They have to have a place. They have to have a safe haven. And and they said, well, it's underground, you dumbass. And um, that really started me um, thinking and um, investigating. And then, you know, I looked at the mound phenomenon as it exists continent-wide. 
and and other indications, you know, all this Bermuda Triangle stuff that that things are are, are coming and going from this underground realm that um, was uh, probably uh, constructed as much as 125,000 years ago. Let's but go yeah, to the phones. The Native, the Native Americans completely understand that. In fact, virtually every Native American tribe says that their origins were from within the earth. And they love talking about the hairy man, the magic man. Let's go uh, to the yeah. phones east of the Rockies. Mark out of Kentucky. Go Big Blue. Hey there, Mark. You're on the air. Oh, thanks for taking my call, Connie. It's a great show. I would like to ask Tom if he's familiar with any government studies or scientific studies on Bigfoot. Very definitely, but, you know, um, don't expect them to share their files with us. You know, I was once told, at, well, Bill, Bill Dranginis, who came up at the beginning of this show, uh, yeah. I, w- I was told that there is a department in the Pentagon for absolutely everything. There, there's nothing, repeat nothing, that they do not study and in very seriously, and and so, of course, the only question is what do they have and when will be will be uh, shared those files? Uh, you know, now they're just kind of opening up the books on the UFO stuff, and it's largely because, you know. It, we already knew <laughs> we we were tired of being lied to and we came to our own conclusions and guys like Jim Mars and uh, all these authors uh, did such a wonderful job of outing the UFO phenomenon that the government finally decided to quit lying to us. We're still waiting for the uh, forthcoming information on the UFOs. I mean, sorry, the Sasquatch as they have done with the UFOs, but um, time will tell. That's about all I can say. The the government isn't going to give you anything until it's already abundantly obvious. But but now that we've had countless TV shows on the Bigfoot thing, I I think they're going to also do the same thing with that. They're they're just going to say, oh, yeah, we, we, we knew it all along. You know, people people discount the planet of the apes, man. I'm telling you, hey, the planet yeah, yeah. of the apes. It uh, it was in born and bred don't, it to don't us a wait long time for ago. The government to be your source of information. You you, you <laughs> got to get it yourself, and then, and then the, yes. the government sources will chime in later uh, yes. after it's all actually fairly irrelevant. Agreed. <laughs> International line, Don, Do out of Alberta, critical? Canada. <laughs> Maybe. No, no, not at all. Uh, Albert. Uh, <laughs> Don, are you there? I'm sorry. Welcome to uh, Coast to Coast AM from the International Line. Oh, there you are. My, my question was, uh, Linda Melton Howe did an interview with uh, the gentleman that had worked on uh, the uh, pyramid up in Alaska that's twice as big as the one in Egypt. Mm-hmm. He was there for four he was a power engineer. He was there for four years, uh, 60s going into 70s. Um, he said it would produce enough electricity to supply all of Alaska and Canada with electricity. It was built 50,000 years ago. But back then, there was monkeys and palm trees, according to another study that I was – people that are digging stuff up. But um, anyway, so it, it's amazing the architecture and the stuff that's around that they cover up. The U.S. military apparently had known about it since 1942, and they they called it a weather station. But you can even look it up on Google Earth. Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering if there was rumors that they uh, they stopped it from producing electricity because it was interfering with HARP. But I don't know. I never was able to confirm that. I was just wondering if you uh, were familiar with that. I I, I am at least peripherally. I, I will say that, um, you know, most of the pyramids are not still producing electricity the way they were perhaps intended, but it would not surprise me if there are some that still are. But you got to mm-hmm. find this book by Christopher Dunn about the pyramid power plant and, and how they uh, really did function 
as power plants. And, and so that is, I think, the defining book on that. And uh, then there's another one by Christopher O'Brien about the cattle mutilations. That's another crazy thing that, that, that clearly suggests when you pick the scab that there are a set of beings that are using our food supply and um, they're very concerned about it. And, and uh, we've infected our, our cattle with uh, these, these prion, prion, however you say it, these, they, that um, it's, it's crazy stuff, but, but there is a set of beings that, that are living with us on our planet and and sharing our food and they're concerned about uh, our our cavalier scientific um, experiments which are compromising the food supply and the and the cattle mutilation phenomenon very clearly points in that same direction. We're going to try to grab one more call here as soon as if if we can take a quick one here. Wild card line number three, Ed. Charlotte, North, North Carolina. Welcome. You're on the air, Ed. Thanks, Tony. I think it's uh, you are so diverse in your knowledge, as Tom is, that it made a great interview since you both have been everywhere. I've got several things. One, are you familiar with the uh, uh, latitude, uh, the, the Great Pyramid? If you write down uh, its location, it's 29.9792458. you got like eight and, and decimals. Perfectly located at the center of the landmass of the whole planet, and it, and its proportions reflect the size of the planet. It's nuts how um, you know it is no accident. <laughs> you are correct in everything you say, and uh, uh, thank you for bringing that up. And. Uh, all I can say is I could go on for the next two hours about the, the, the importance of what you're discussing. Are you there? I was asking if Ed had another question, but uh, Ed, are you still there? So, I'm, I'm, hmm. I'm here, Connie. How about you? Okay. All right. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, I was asking, and I guess I was muted out there on my, my own as I was coughing, and then I forgot to put the mute button back on. The cough button sometimes does that. It's a weird new cough button in the world. It's no longer the cough button with just our fingers here. Well, it used to I be on the you, radio control board. yesterday, and <laughs> every time we got into sensitive subjects, the, 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 the line would interrupt. <laughs> oh, I get, I you get it, I get it. On your uh, interviews, that, that all of a sudden, like, there's some sort of power that doesn't necessarily <laughs> want this information to be. Oh, hey, <laughs> we're on coast, right? Listen, <laughs> we got to wrap up here. Thanks so much, Tom. I'm glad to get back a hold of you, and thank you, and best of luck with your book. Oh, Connie, I love you. It's been so great to know you over the years, and um, I just, just uh, wish you so well. Uh, and, so good luck, and um, I love the work you're doing. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.